The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. You have to work for something like this. You can't just walk out your front door and see this. Just figuring out what oyster farming would look like in Texas, and that's actually a way more complicated question than it sounds. I try to generate an image that somehow captures the feeling of the place. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Out here, the first two hours of my day, I don't have to worry about like, all the stress and the hustle and bustle of like, the city. I just wake up and I'll go fix myself some breakfast and just pack up my gear and then wait and see how the day holds so I'm not like, in a rush. Bikepacking is absolutely the perfect speed to experience nature because you're going slow enough to where you can enjoy everything around you. You can look up and look at the mountains and the vistas, but you can look down right in front of your tire and look at the rocks, or you can look at the cacti and every, you know, little animals that are scurrying by. So you, you have the opportunity to like experience all of that. So I just found a fossil. Um, I was just biking along right back there and I looked down um, and it was right to the left of my tire. I like really love learning natural history of places so this is cool because like all of this used to be underwater. So I get excited when I find stuff like this because it's like, you know, relics of that different time period when Big Ben looked a lot different than it does now. We started off where the blue bonnets were alongside the highway, like we saw them before we were even entering into Big Bend State Park. And so it's really cool to start, you know, off the highway, just like where the blue bonnets did, and we see what they go through. Like, we follow the river down and we know where they land. I'm not going to sit down and write about the copper colored jagged rock that meets the earth where it crumbles into the runoff from Madrid Falls. And I mean, that's been written and you can go over the top and nobody really wants to read that at this point. I'm more interested in how the 
land affects the people and the people that love it and what it means to them. On Monday, I fell 17 times. <laughs> and then on Tuesday, I fell eight times. <laughs> and then on Wednesday, I fell six times. Oh, I didn't even know that was there. It's blood. <laughs> then today, we're not three, but I've only fallen once. <laughs> so I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> and it was in gravel, so it was a nice soft landing, like landing in like feathers. A year from now, I think I definitely will remember the friendships I've made here. It's just crazy, like, how much fun <laughs> this whole group is. Also, this is super hard. <laughs> so First time the charm! <laughs> it was like, it's like, here's the trail, here's Cody. <laughs> Yes, the pain of the riding and the, the exhaustion of the riding will go and fade away in, into memory, but the thing that'll stick the most is I think the people and the stories and the friends you, you meet on the way. This morning we were all the way over there on the other side of that mountain right there. We've gone a little over 20 of the worst miles that we've done the whole trip. Sick nasty. Sick nasty, bro. But man, it's a lot of fun. And this view right here is just, this is the best one that I've had so far. I'm tearing up right now. This is just huge and like, oh, this is awesome. It's fantastic. <laughs> I look out into this, that's when I kind of realize like, this is what we've been given. And this is something that you have to go out and seek. Like, you have to work for something like this. You can't, you can't just walk out your front door and see this. I consider myself an oyster tourist, so when I go to other cities, I like to try all the different unique boutique oysters that you can get. And I think it's really cool that Texas might have a boutique oyster scene like some of these other metropolitan areas do. The coastal economies are, are very impacted by fisheries resources, not just directly by, by commercial and recreational fishermen. Those things also bring business. You have local economy, you have coastal economy, you know, the fishermen themselves, the restaurants they're selling to, the entire industry that comes up around that. So it is a, it's a fairly large umbrella. And even the culture, coastal culture, it's gonna have a place in that as well. Texas recently adopted um, legislation to bring oyster mariculture to the Texas coast. And that's basically going to be oyster farming in Texas. And so our deputy director started that program, and I was on the work group helping them figure out various aspects of program design. But then when he retired, 
nobody really championed the program. And for some reason I did. <laughs> Yeah, Emma was, was involved with this really from the beginning. She plays a big role in terms of habitat monitoring and management along the Texas coast. And it, it became pretty clear that this oyster mariculture program needed a champion. Emma just picked up that baton and ran with it. And th this was a huge task, but she just emerged as the person that was gonna take this to the finish line. And she did an outstanding job. Just figuring out what oyster farming would look like in Texas, and that's actually a way more complicated question than it sounds. There's a ton of moving parts and a lot of things we had to figure out along the way. I have made it my own personal task to know this information because I feel like if we're gonna regulate it, we really need to understand it. So I've looked up all of the gear, I've gone to these trainings, I've gone to the research farm and learned how the gear works and talked to Sea Grant. The Commercial Oyster Mariculture Program allows individuals to start up private oyster growing operations in, in the bays of Texas. There's a lot of pressure put on the natural resource, that being oysters harvested off of natural reefs. We view this as hopefully a solution to maintaining that as a sustainable resource and supplementing the total oyster harvest out of Texas with these privately grown oysters. The first application for uh, cultivated oyster mariculture actually came to the bay system that, that I oversee into Aransas Bay. That was a huge, huge first step for the program when we actually received that application. We've had an amazing team working on this and I just want to make sure that comes through is that it's been a group effort. And I do hope this does take some pressure off of the wild oyster reefs. And one thing that I kind of hope for as a consumer is that we have a little bit more of that seafood culture and that connection with our seafood in our restaurants and coastal communities. My first love of photography is probably wildlife. You know, when I was a young photographer, that's really what I concentrated on was shooting, shooting pictures of wildlife. But really as my career has evolved, I'm becoming known more now for, for capturing the Texas culture, you know, and trying to capture those people and places that really epitomize what it's like to be Texan and what it means to be a Texan. This country was built on the backs of cowboys and Comanche Indians and bison hunters, and, and early on I learned about all the history of all three of those groups and how they tie in and how they really interweave into the tapestry of this country in, in the Texas Rolling Plains. Because of that, I became enamored with the history of the buffalo hunter and the history of the bison in Texas and on the South Plains. I was at Caprock Canyon State Park early one evening shooting pictures of the buffalo and their buffalo herd there at the state park. And this one single bull was grazing. And then at the very last minute, the very last light, he turned and looked towards the sun. And I was able to capture a moment that's really become iconic. I know when a lot of people talk about pictures I've taken, they talk about that one photo that was taken probably 12 years ago. When people ask me the secret to taking a great photograph, I tell them there's really not a secret at all. It, it's really about if you can, you can think of anything that you want to be. You, you say, I want to be good at blank. And if it's basketball or if it's baseball or if it's making quilts or if it's photography, it all boils down to doing a few key things right every time and understanding the elements within that discipline so your results become predictable. Like in photography, I, I tell people a, a couple of things they need to think about all the time. They need to think about light first and foremost, whether it's natural light with the sun or artificial light if you're introducing some strobes. Uh, composition is a, is a key component of it in my mind. You know, comp composition is one thing that if you learn it and learn it well, you can transform mediocre photos to great photos almost overnight. It makes a huge change in the way your ph photographs look. I get asked a lot about what kind of equipment someone can buy that, that'll make them a great photographer. You know, really being a great photographer is a little bit about the equipment, but it's a lot about inspiration. It's a lot about understanding your subject and understanding how to interact with that subject, whether that subject's a, a landscape or whether it's people in the outdoors or whether it's, it's wildlife. It's just taking the time to do all the background information and understanding what it is you're taking pictures of. I spend as much time researching a subject is, or twice as much time researching a subject as I do actually photographing it because when I go into a situation, I've got a finite amount of time and so I want to know all I can about what I'm taking a picture of, whether it's whether I'm traveling to the Big Bend to shoot pictures of, of great landscapes or whether I'm traveling to, uh, 
to, to the northern panhandle to shoot pictures of prairie chickens, or whether I'm tra traveling to someone's farm to shoot a picture of, of their hard-earned labor and their hard work and, and what it means to be a farmer in Texas, I try to know as much as I can about the subject. And to me, more than equipment, it, that's the secret to being a, a great photographer. Whoa, you didn't get that, did you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually I did. I was born in Dallas, got to experience the Midwest, the Northeast, quite a few years in Houston. Billy Hassel lives in the urban world. Didn't move back to the area until about 15 years ago, then I've made Fort Worth home ever since. But Billy has always been drawn to the natural world. Reconnecting with nature in a small way, in a very urban environment, it calms the soul somehow if you can slow down. We live fast-paced lives, and we're kind of conditioned, I think, to think we have to live in rush all the time. But follow Billy to work, and his interest in nature becomes most apparent. Here we are in my studio. I'm a full-time artist. My work has always been inspired by nature. I grew up in a time when there were still some open spaces and creeks, and I got to experience a little bit of nature, even though I grew up in a pretty urban environment. I guess my love of nature was born from those experiences, and I've been kind of searching for that throughout the rest of my life. I've been seeking out opportunities to be out in nature and find places to inspire my work. You see these oak groves from a distance, and they are their sort of own little world. In early fall, a new project finds Billy seeking natural inspiration along the coast. This is a cool spot. This might be a spot to come back to and set up a chair in watercolor. Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation has commissioned Billy to create a series of prints celebrating wildlife habitat conservation statewide. We decided on five land projects around the state of Texas, Powderhorn being kind of the jewel in the crown. Billy's first lithograph will feature Powderhorn Ranch, 17,000 acres of newly conserved coastal prairie and marsh on Matagorda Bay. It's very heartening to me to see large areas of land like this preserved for the future. You had to put it all into one picture. You couldn't fit it all. That's the challenge. Prickly pear and a rattlesnake. The more you look, the more you see. <laughs> it is cool to watch them move. I find a lot of inspiration as an artist in a place like this. And as I learn more and more about it, I'm fascinated by the complexities of it and how practically every plant and every little creature plays a role in the overall balance of a place. If I sit down to do a watercolor, I have to sit the chair down, find a spot, commit myself to at least an hour, an hour and a half of time. In a pencil sketch, I can frequently get a, at least a contour of the shadows. The cactus, I got a little more detailed on the shapes, and, and the, the line drawings kind of helped me put it into a bigger context. The length of time it takes to do a watercolor, by the time you're three quarters of the way finished, the light has changed completely. That's the advantage of having a photograph to refer to just for the light and the color. For years, I didn't even own a camera. If I take a picture, I let the camera be the memory, and if I draw it, I think I have to remember it in my head. There's something about the process of visualizing something and processing what you're seeing that burns a more indelible memory. It's 
just being in a place, just walking through a place and hearing the wind blow and seeing things, it seeps in. I try to generate an image that somehow captures the feeling of the place. Let's see, I want a nice warm green. Yeah, pick a color, any color. <laughs> One month That's after easy. his field visit, Billy has an image for his print. So I'm here at Peter Webb's shop in Austin, where we're turning my drawings into a color lithograph. With his printer, Billy builds the image one color at a time. Everything is by hand. He has to basically take his image, deconstruct it, and then reconstruct it. The artist has to draw each and every plate. He's actually drawing the whole print right here. The drawing is transferred by light onto the plate. Traditionally, lithographs were printed from limestone. Aluminum plates have replaced the limestone, but essentially it's the same process that it's been for 300 years. This develops. I hate to call it a dying art form, but I feel like by doing the lithographs, I'm somehow keeping an old process alive. So we could take it out later if... Uh... Oh, did I say Each <laughs> color is hand inked, hand printed, and usually there are about 12 to 15 colors. So that's 15 passes through a press to get one image. All my drawings are done in black and white, so there's this sort of magic thing that happens when we assign colors to each plate and then we combine the colors and we achieve this end result. Each color is printed, one on top of another, and then when all the colors are printed, you have a finished print. It's a one-shot deal. I think it's somehow appropriate to be celebrating these places as a limited edition work of art. Ta-da! <laughs> we did it. There'll be editions of 30, and once they're gone, they're gone. And in a way, it is like the land that's inspiring the prints. Back at his studio in Fort Worth, Billy completes other work to be shown with his lithograph. So I'm working on a group of paintings for a show that's going to open in Fort Worth in a couple of weeks. So I've got a few oil paintings that are in progress. Billy's time at Powderhorn has inspired much more than one print. It's kind of evolved into a, almost a whole show of work based on that. I make my gallery owners a little nervous sometimes because I'm down to the wire usually, but I always deliver. <laughs> We're at the William Campbell Contemporary Art Gallery here in Fort Worth. Wonderful show. Beautiful. Thank you. Tonight is the opening of a show of new paintings and the unveiling of the Powderhorn Ranch lithograph. This has generated quite a stir. Pulled in the crowd tonight. This is kind of the culmination of uh, weeks of work and sweat and anxiety over getting it all done in time. And my only anxiety now is uh, that there's not any wet paint that anybody's going to bump into inside there. I like the one in the back, it's powerful. Paintings have sold, and prints have sold, and I think there's going to be a lot of interest in the Powderhorn Ranch lithograph. And I do think people make the association or think about the coastal prairie of Texas and also the fragility of nature. While preserving nature in paint and ink has a beauty all its own, proceeds from Billy's print will also help Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation keep places like Powderhorn Ranch wild forever. When this was proposed to me, I was thrilled. With more lithographs in the series, it'll be about a three-year project. Billy Hassel has more natural inspiration to look forward to. I hope that the prints reach people and make people aware of Powderhorn, but also just aware of the world and how precious it is.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.